Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. My name is Dr. Sarah Mackey from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Here at Lawrence Livermore, data science has become an essential discipline in many of our key program areas. LLNL is home to many challenging data sets, as well as home to some of the world's most advanced supercomputers. Our data science staff work in a variety of areas, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, statistical inference, predictive modeling, and uncertainty quantification. The Data Science Institute acts as a central hub for our lab's data science activities. We host events like this seminar series in order to introduce new ideas and potential collaborations to our laboratory staff. We invite speakers from outside the laboratory, from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative approaches with our data science community. We are pleased now to include a wider audience in our seminar series through these recordings. You can read about past speakers at our website at data-science.llnl.gov or you can email us at datascience at llnl.gov. Thank you and enjoy the seminar series. It's my pleasure today to introduce Tina Eliasirad. Uh, Dr. Eliasirad is a professor of computer science at Northeastern University. She's also a faculty member at Northeastern's Network Science Institute and the Institute for Experiential AI. In addition, she's an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute and the Complex and the Vermont Complex Systems Center. Before she joined Northeastern, Tina was an associate professor of computer science at Rutgers. And before that, she was a member of technical te technical staff here at LLNL. Her research is at the intersection of data mining, machine learning, and network science. Her work has been applied to personalized search on the World Wide Web, statistical indices of large scale scientific simulation data, fraud detection, mobile ad targeting, cyber situational awareness, drug discovery, democracy and online discourse, and ethics and machine learning. Her algorithms have been incorporated into systems used by governments and industry, as well as open so source software, including the Stanford Network Analysis Project. Um, so Tina will talk to us today about just machine learning. And Tina, when you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for the invitation and that kind introduction. It's great to be here. I see lots of folks uh, who I consider my friends and lots of folks with whom some of the work you were mentioning were done with, like Keith Henderson, who is the smartest, still the smartest person. Uh, I have met and I'm the awesomest. So if you don't know Keith Henderson, look him up. <laughs> uh, and I see Andy and lots of folks uh, from CASC. So it's an honor to be here. And uh, the work I'm going to talk about is basically my night job. My day job is still um, the kind of work that I was doing at uh, Lawrence before I left, which is uh, can we come up with machine learning, data mining algorithms? on graphs and networks for, for example, cybersecurity or other kinds of national security applications. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about just machine learning. Um, and if the title is a little ambiguous, um, it's on purpose. So she's talking about just machine learning or look, it's just machine learning, like what's the big deal? And uh, over the course of the talk, you can decide which one it is. So when you think about components of a machine learning system, uh, the first thing that oftentimes comes to somebody's mind is the task. But the task is often some prediction task. You know, I give you uh, a task to predict um, houses, uh, so, uh, so price of houses, right? Um, how much, like what Zillow does. Uh, or I give you a prediction task in terms of recommendation, uh, what would Tina like to buy? And these things often come with data. Uh, one of the issues uh, around machine learning is that uh, the machine learning data mining folks oftentimes um, think of data as gospel uh, versus um, data is noisy, is missing, um, uh, has missing values, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll get into it. So you have the task and the data, then you have the model, some mathematical model that's going to represent uh, whatever prediction task you have. And then, of course, you have your loss function and your optimization algorithm. Uh, you need the optimization algorithm and the loss function to learn, for example, here the weights on um, these uh, on this feed-forward neural network. 
So I'm going to go through some of these and the problems with them. You probably have heard a lot about data and issues with data. In particular, you probably have heard about foundation models or these large language models. They're oftentimes trained on data that's available on the web. And even if you were to quote unquote clean that data, um, you are still going to get uh, racist, um, misogynistic content. Uh, and some of you may have heard about how, for example, you give to GPT, GPT-3 um, something like um, two Muslims walk into a bar and then it finishes it off with something along the line of some explosion happens. Now, you may think that a lot of the problems are with data that's online. So, like, you shouldn't worry about the data that you have. Um, and that is not true. Um, so, um, during COVID, obviously, we were all interested in these oximeters uh, because it tells um, the oxygen saturation in your blood. And there was this article about how um, these oximeters don't work on darker skinned people. And this was a December of 2020. And then back then there was another article that was published saying, oh, we knew this in 2005 and 2007. I digged into the work in 2005. It had a reference to work in 1992 and the work in 1992 had a reference to work in 1990 and the work in 1990 had a reference to work in 1987. So way back in 1987, we knew that these oximeters did not work for darker skinned people. It's just that nobody cared, right? And, but imagine all of this data that is now being fed over these years, these historical data that get fed into machine learning algorithms for you know, predicting what you should do with a patient that comes in. And so there was this work um, that finally was published in December of 2021 by Timnit Dibru et al. that said, basically what we should have are these data sheets for data sets, or you can think of them as birth certificates, where we should, every data set should have an accompanying documentation about what was the motivation for this data set? How was it composed? How was it collected? How, how did you clean it? What are its uses? What is its distribution? And what are its maintenance? So this is very good thing to do, though it kind of falls into documentation and most people don't like documentation, but it is Im imperative that we have these, especially when the tasks are uh, high stakes tasks, which I will get to, such as policing, criminal justice, et cetera, et cetera. So along, around this time, my colleague, um, Debbie Ramirez, who is a law professor, said, can we generate aspirational data? And initially, when I heard it, I was like, what do you mean by aspirational data? It seemed fishy. Then Debbie um, defined it as synthetic data from ideally fair circumstances. And so then the question is, what is an ideally fair circumstance? And so we looked at John Rawls's work. Um, John Rawls was a very famous political philosopher at Harvard and wrote this book, A Theory of Justice, back in 1971 about a well-ordered society. And he said, a society is well-ordered when it advances the good of its members and is effectively regulated by public concep conception of justice. And in particular, if you look at John Rawls's work, there are two principles. One is principle of fair equality of opportunity, and the other one is the difference principle. We picked on the principle of uh, fair equality of opportunity because you can represent it as conditional independence. And of course, we know how to formalize conditional independence. Now, the one thing with FEO is that it is only applicable to a very small slice of decisions. So it really has to do with fair allocation of advantageous positions in society. So tenure track positions, high paying jobs, a job at a national laboratory. So it's, it's very narrow, but still we can formalize it. And because you can formalize it as conditional independence, then we can just use something like, okay, well, um, the probability of securing an advantageous position, this Y, should be independent of any protected attribute, this X of P, given some justified variables, like your talent, for example. And so because of that, we can easily formalize it. And so we asked this question where given an unfair in the Rawlsian sense outcome uh, and the 
capacity of changing something about the decision making process, can we satisfy FEO? And so we developed a system called RawlsNet, which is a system for altering parameters of a Bayesian network to satisfy FEO. And this was a work with my students, David Liu, Zohair Shafi, my postdoc, Will Fleischer, who's going to start as a tenure track um, professor at Georgetown University, and Scott Alfeld, who is an assistant professor at Amherst College. And so what is this RawlsNet? It has three components. Uh, it learns a Bayesian network from your um, data. Uh, it learns the structure and the parameters of it. Um, it determines whether your application is relevant to fairy tale opportunity. A lot of them aren't. As I said, fairy tale opportunity is very narrow. And then it updates the parameters of the Bayesian network to satisfy that conditional independence that's represented by FEO. Now, there are many cases in which it's not possible to satisfy FEO. For example, getting admitted to Harvard is a advantageous position, but Harvard can only accept so many students. And so if that is the case, then we update the parameters to approximately satisfy FEO. And so here is a um, simple example uh, of uh, a Bayesian network where uh, we have a social economic status. Your social economic status can be low or high. You have talent. Um, your talent and your social economic status affects your test scores. Your test scores and your social economic status affects the college you go. And then um, the college you went and your social economic status affects the job that you get. Now, here we're representing each of these variables as with these conditional probability tables. You can have anything you like in there. You can have a deep network as far as you, you want. Um, but for this, we also wanted it to be explainable. And so what we are going to be doing is we're going to be changing the uh, parameters for college to make sure that we satisfy John Rawls's fair equality of opportunity. Um, so how does this work? We're going to try to optimize this FEO. So we are going to change um, the theta, the parameters for college. And the optimization problem is very simple. We want to find a theta for college that will minimize the following uh, objective function. Basically, the difference between you getting a job where you're not talented, uh, but you have come from a high social economic status or low social economic status should be low. And the probability of you getting a job, given that you are talented, should also not depend on your um, social economic status. And then, of course, there are these feasibility constraints. And so you can solve this optimization problem and you can get the right thetas, uh, the right parameters for college. And so here's a simple simulation that we ran on this one. Uh, so your life is very boring. You're born, you, you take a test, uh, you go to college, you get a job. Um, on the y-axis are the probabilities. And obviously what you will like is that the probability of you landing a job uh, should not depend on your uh, social economic status. And so this is before applying RawlsNet. And on the right side, it's when we do apply um, our system to modify the parameters of college, the random variable college, and we see that we are able to effectively um, change it so that um, uh, the probability of getting a job is high if you're talented. Uh, it doesn't depend on your socioeconomic status. And if you have uh, feasibility constraints, then we can't exactly match FEO, but we can get close, right? Where, of course, in our society with these feasibility constraints, um, people who have talent and um, come from high socioeconomic status have a higher probability of getting a job. But if you're talented and um, don't come from a high socioeconomic status, then your probability of getting a job is still higher than if you were not talented. There are many different uses of our system, RawlsNet. One is you can generate that aspirational data that my colleague and friend Debbie Ramirez wanted. And the other thing is that it could be an aid for policymakers in decision making. So, for example, in college admissions, um, the 1 thing, which is very important is talent, right? The distribution of talent. So, if you really want to do well by your society and be fair and all that good things, you really need to have boots on the ground that could. A talk, for example, with the counselors and have a good distribution on the talent and not just go with what ought to what you believe a priori who has talent and who doesn't.
So then going back to the components of the machine learning system, we talked about data, now we're gonna move on to the model. You may say, well, okay, if I have this fair data, then I shouldn't worry, right? I, I give my fair data to my model and I'm good to go. And so we ask this question, given a fair data distribution and the structure of a Bayesian network, this fair being the FEO, does maximum likelihood estimation learn parameters that produce that fair posterior distribution? And what we found was not necessarily, right? It depends on the correctness of the Bayesian network structure that you're learning. It uh, depends on the faithfulness of the joint distribution that you learned and the Bayesian network structure. It depends on the correctness of the learned joint distribution. And it depends on whether you're interested in only asymptotic behavior. And so this gets us to work by um, Margaret Mitchell et al, where similar to data sheets for data sets, they propose model cards for model reporting. When again, this is like a long form birth certificate or documentation for a model where you highlight, well, what are the model details? What was the intended uses? What are the factors? What are the metrics? What were your training data? How did you, uh, what did you use for evaluation data? Was there any ethical consideration, et cetera? And one of the good things about this, so for example, for this model card for smiling detection in images, you can see that it does poorly on old males. I believe you're seeing my mouse. And so the false discovery rate for old males is bad. And so this notion that my model will work on anything and on anybody is obviously wrong. There's no master algorithm. And so at least being honest in terms of, okay, my model only, for example, works for white males between 30 and 50. And that is just fine. It's just that unfortunately we live in a society that people don't wanna be honest about who their model was trained on and on whom would it work. So now I'm gonna spend a lot of time on task and I'm not gonna talk so much about the loss function and the optimization algorithm because the task itself, a lot of people do not question it and it needs to be questioned. So there was this paper that came out of science um, back in 2009 about how algorithms are being used in healthcare and how um, there are lots of racial biases in them. And in particular, this is a, a piece from this text that says, um, the algorithm predicted healthcare costs rather than Ill illness. And so this is a classic case of what they were measuring is not the same thing as what they thought they were measuring. So healthcare costs is not the same as measuring severity of illness, at least not in the USA. And one of the other things which was interesting is that this prediction task was um, assessing risk scores. Risk scores and assessing them are really popular. And they're popular for two apparent reasons, at least to me, and there are probably other ones as well. So one is machine learning people know a lot about them. It is a low hanging fruit, bringing a phrase from George W. Bush's term, um, because risk assessment is really sorting. Um, and we really know about sorting. So when you think about classification, it's just sorting, right? Good, bad, fraud, not fraud, et cetera. And the other thing is that the human decision makers really like the output of risk assessment, right? The risk of Tina defaulting on the loan is eight. So Tina won't get it, but the risk, uh, Tina won't get the loan, but the risk of Keith defaulting on the loan is two. So Keith gets the loan, right? And so it's very clear cut. And in fact, there are cases right now going through the courts where a judge overthrew a plea deal that human beings made because a risk assessment software said the risk of the guy um, recidivating was high. Now, the one thing uh, that I wanna make clear here is that these risk assessment software also do not provide any uncertainty values, right? So there's absolutely nothing about the fact that, okay, if risk of Tina defaulting on a loan is nine, how sure is uh, the algorithm about this? Now, there are other issues with risk assessment, and in particular, uh, there are impossibility results. So a lot of the work in fairness on machine learning, um, uh, accountability in machine learning, that we'll talk about those, um, or um, algorithmic bias is about looking at a confusion matrix or an error matrix and basically coming up with parity measures where you want, for example, uh, precision between uh, the whites and the non-whites to be the same. 
And so back in 2016, Childokova published a paper that said the following. Suppose that I can divide my population into two mutually exclusive groups. I have females and non-females. And suppose that I have unequal base rates. So the probability of females having breast cancer is not the same as probability of males having breast cancer. Seems reasonable so far. Or, or the probability of non-females having breast cancer. And then she said, suppose I want to have statistical parity among my groups. That is, for my classifier, I want it to have uh, the same probability of predicting breast cancer for females as it does for non-females. And so what happened was that she showed with simple axioms of probability that you cannot have predictive parity, true positive parity, and false positive parity at the same time. Hence, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And we'll talk about these parity measures in a little bit. Then back in 2016, John Kleinberg also published the paper where he said, suppose I can divide my population again into two mutually exclusive groups, females and non-females. I have unequal base rates. Probability of females getting breast cancer is not the same as non-females getting breast cancer. But he said, I'm going to get rid of the statistical parity. I'm just going to assume I have an imperfect classifier. And if you come across a perfect classifier, run the other way, and that I have non-zero precision. And again, he showed that you cannot have these three parity measures that you want across your groups. Then in 2021, with Feidelson, we showed that you don't even need to have mutual exclusivity. So if, for example, you're dividing your groups between whites and non-whites, you don't even need to have that. You can have somebody like Barack Obama, who's both white and black. As long as you have unequal base rates, imperfect classifier, and, and in non-zero precision, you cannot satisfy um, these three parity measures. And in fact, we were able to simplify this even a bit further, where as long as you have unequal base rates, right, the probability of getting breast cancer between females and non-females not being the same, and as long as you have these regular priors, that is, you do not assign extreme values of probability to non-contingent um, propositions, these be being the ones that are necessary or impossible, then you still can't satisfy these three parity measures. And this is just straight from axioms of probability. You don't need to do much. And it, if you want to play with it, you can download this mathematical notebook and, and come up with your own impossibility results. So what happened? What happened when these impossibility results came out? Uh, computer scientists are very good at bastardizing things. So they're like, we get rid of one of the parities. And a lot of the papers on algorithmic bias or fairness in machine learning get rid of one of the parities or put a bound on one of these parities. Now, Deborah Hellman, who's a law professor at University of Virginia, actually started thinking about what do these parity measures mean? And so she was like, predictive parity means what you ought to believe, and true positive and false positive parities means what you ought to do. And if you're going to get rid of one of them, then you should get rid of predictive parity, because predictive parity has to do about the what you think are the right-making properties, and in our society, at least, the right-making properties are being a, is being a white male. And uh, if you may have heard about the famous Compass um, software from North Point that ProPublica did a study back in 2016 uh, about Broward County and how ProPublica showed that their software was racist and, and uh, North Point's defense was that, well, we had predictive parity, right? <laughs> Which, uh, of course, um, uh, was not good enough. So then what about individual fairness, right? So we've been talking about group fairness. Um, there's been lots of work, especially from folks who do differential privacy about individual fairness, that if me and Keith are similar, then we should be treated similarly. And so my postdoc, uh, Will Fleischer, who, as I said, is joining Georgetown as an assistant professor, wrote this really nice paper about what's fair about individual fairness. And he pointed out a few problems with individual fairness. So one is that just because you treat me and Keith the same way doesn't mean that we are being treated fairly. Um, the other one is depending on who are, you pick, um, there are these kind of human biases. And so one person may say they're similar and another person may say they're not. Um, the third is um, what features do you use to measure similarity? Do you have a moral distance function? And the last one is there are situations where they are incommensurable. So, for example, how would you equate money, getting more money, with prestige, for example, right? And so his takeaways were that individual fairness is not um, an adequate measure 
uh, as a definition of fairness, and it should never be used by itself to determine fairness. So now let's move a bit back up um, to our machine learning system. And of course, your machine learning system is not an island. However much you believe it's an island, it is not. It is part of a complex system. And I like this uh, picture because it talks about complex systems. For example, your brain is a complex system, an ant colony is a complex system, the World Wide Web is a complex system. It talks about it in terms of features, right? So you have on the outside, you have the necessary conditions, you need randomness, you need um, numerosity, so lots of different uh, heterogeneous elements. Uh, you have diversity, you have feedback, you have non-equilibrium. In the middle, you have emergent features, like the, the nested structures we see in complex networks. Um, you have non-linearity. And in uh, the inside, you have features of the functional um, system, such as adaptive behavior, memory, et cetera. And so taking this into account uh, with uh, my student, Shindy Wang, who is now working at Amazon, and Oran Veral, who's a postdoc, who is now a professor at, you know, in Turkey, at a university in Turkey, uh, we wrote this paper that recently came out about information access equality on generative models of complex networks where we looked at uh, different um, complex network models. So you have first, for example, an Aaron Rainey random network, and then you add preferential attachment to it. Then you add homophily, where like attracts like. Then, for example, you add diversity. And we wanted to see how uh, information uh, propagates through this network and whether um, you have any kind of equality in terms of how this information propagates. Now, there have been some work in this area and usually from the computer science side, they just think about the network structure, but not the actual content that is um, flowing through this network. And so just in a, in a nutshell, these were our findings. One is that if you are in, interested in information access equality, so if you want the information to uh, um, get to your whites and your non-whites at the same rate, um, you shouldn't just worry about the network structure, you should also worry about the spreading process. Is your spreading process a simple contagion or a complex contagion? Uh, is your spreading process spreading symmetrically or asymmetrically between your group? So it's a complex interplay between them. Um, then there is a trade-off between equality and efficiency in terms of this information access. In particular, we noticed that when your network has segregated groups, so you have very low intergroup edges and you have the asymmetric transmission rates, um, then um, you, you bump up against this trade-off between efficiency of the information spread versus the equality that you want among your groups. Uh, we noticed that the spreading process features are all, were all uh, statistically significant. So here, think about, again, whether the information is uh, spreading symmetrically or asymmetrically, or whether it's a simple contagion or a complex contagion. Um, so a complex contagion often happens when the information is novel uh, versus a simple contagion. You can think about, for example, strength of weak ties about getting a job um, by talking to an acquaintance, for example. Well, one of the things which was interesting was that the network structure features were not always statistically significant, but two of the network features stood out. One was degree inequality and the other one was network distance. Um, so here you can think about diameter, average shortest path. And in particular, in terms of impact of our findings is that you can, if you're interested in, uh, recommend connections that will steer your online social network toward information access equality. Now, the way that to do that, though, is the first thing to do is to classify the spreading process, right? What are the features of the spreading process? Then based on that, the people that you recommend that Tina connects to um, could be people that could steer the network into more information access equality. Then around the same time, we had a paper in Nature uh, with these fine uh, scholars about uh, how our societies are now algorithmically infused. And this goes back again to this notion that um, your algorithm is not an island, right? So when you are on Amazon and Amazon's recommendation algorithms recommend something for you to buy and you buy that item, that affects the economic processes. And then in turn, that affects um, the, the, the goals of the platform, these kinds of sponsored items you see on Amazon. Obviously, you all know about the political processes and the kind of news that you consume and how that affects our political regulations. 
And then they're also in terms of these online dating sites, right? And how they recommend who you should date and that affects our um, social um, accept, uh, accept, acceptability of who we date. And in particular, in this paper, we identified three challenges. Um, the first one was there's insufficient quality of measurements. Like nobody looks at, okay, what are the quality of uh, the data that you're collecting? Um, the second one was the complex consequences of mismeasurement. And here, I highly recommend this free book that was published at MIT Press last year by Cesar Hidalgo on how humans judge machines, where when harm is done by another human to you, um, you assign intent to that human. But when harm is done to you by a machine, you do not assign intent to the machine, right? So for some reason, um, it's as if the person who design the machine didn't have an intent and we'll come back to it. And then the last one is that the existing social theories that we have uh, were developed when we didn't live in societies that were algorithmically infused. And so we need to go back to them because uh, they have limits. So for addressing the first challenge in terms of in, uh, sufficient quality of measurements, you need to get your data from multiple places, right? And try to triangulate it. You need to develop guidelines and best practices in terms of which data you use and which data you don't. Data is not gossipable, right? You need to think about where it's coming from and what distribution and what processes are generating it. In terms of the complex consequences of mismeasurements, you need to reflect on what to measure and what not to measure, right? And we need to develop professional norms. So there's a lot of discussion in terms of regulations are coming from the government, but um, unlike other fields in computer science, AI, machine learning, data mining, et cetera, we do not have any professional norms. It seems like there's nothing you could do that would, uh, you know, get you excommunicated from the profession. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then there are limits of existing social theories, right? So what we need to do is we need to re-examine the social theories of, for example, social capital, uh, strength of weak ties, theory of balance, et cetera, now that we do live in these societies uh, that are um, algorithmically infused. And of course, we need to be transparent. So stuff like model cards, like data sheets, those are extremely important. So now we go back to this, again, this machine learning system being part of a complex system. And I wanna talk about some work that we did in 2019 and 2020, where we looked at democratic backsliding. So um, The Economist, um, the weekly magazine, every year they publish this democracy index and they track it over multiple years. And there are lots of different things about civic participation, et cetera, that goes into this democracy index. And um, so, you know, you, you expect what you normally would expect where you have Norway on the top, 10 is the highest score, zero is the lowest. North Korea is the lowest. Um, with with Hungary, we're seeing this decrease in 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 um, this democracy index. In the U.S., we also saw um, a bit of a down slope here. And so, what we thought was, if we think about democracy as a complex system, uh, then can we represent uh, its stability or instability, as the case may be, as this democratic backsliding? And so the question is, what is stability? Because people oftentimes mix up stability and robustness. And here we're talking about temporal stability. So stability in terms of persistence over time, resistance to change. Um, and so here, for example, a ball on top of a peak is not stable, right? It will come on, uh, it will fall on either side of it. In terms of robustness, this notion of modal robustness is that you are insensitive to microscopic um, changes. And so K and N's, K nearest neighbors, are not robust. Uh, I can add a, uh, a data instance and your K and N would produce um, different results. And so here, in terms of uh, democratic backsliding, we're talking about instability and that instability um, uh, having this, this definition of stability that you're seeing to the, to the left. So as part of that, we published these two papers on democratic backslidings. The first one on the left was about how if you think about um, democracy as a complex system, then you can describe its democratic backsliding. And the second paper was about how if you again think about it as a complex system, you can propose some, uh, some policy changes. 
Um, and in particular, one of the things which is interesting is in a democracy, um, a lot of fires get started, but a lot of fires get put out, right? So you'd really need randomness uh, and, and diversity in a democracy. However, there is this point where if there's too much randomness, um, then you tip over. And then people start believing in, in, in the lying demagogues uh, where they're like, look, the system doesn't work for you. And so then there's this notion of let's burn down the entire system. And um, so, and, 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 the, and the machine learning and the data mining algorithms are not helping here, right? Um, because again, well, okay, this system, the, this facial recognition system doesn't work for me if I have darker skin, for example. And it, I know that this this um, this audience knows about complex systems, but uh, if you want to spread the gospel, Carolyn Wiesner, who was one of the um, authors of these two papers, has a new book, uh, What is a Complex System, which is really nice, um, in particular for computer scientists, uh, because it talks about complex systems in terms of those features that I was talking about. And then the last part I wanted to talk to you guys about in this roadmap of just machine learning, which is one of my projects, um, although my night project, <laughs> as opposed to my day project, is uh, how do AI researchers describe and respond to the negative impact of their work on society? And so we had a paper again in AIES, this AI Ethics and Society, uh, by my student David Liu and, and Priyanka, who's a graduate student at, uh, at, at Northwestern and a bunch of other folks, looking at all the NeurIPS uh, 2021 um, negative societal impact and the ethical review. And so, um, in terms of the impact statements that the AI researchers wrote, uh, we found these three themes. The first one was lack of agency. That look, I'm just doing math. Yes, uh, an, an adversary can take this and use it for bad things, but look, I, I'm, I'm nowhere to be found, right? It's not my fault. I'm just doing good math. Look at this nice math I'm doing. Um, the other one was denying responsibility, right? Or trying to like minimize the negative societal impact of it. Uh, like, yes, you know, training this model with billions of parameters may burn the world down, but it's okay, it's fine, right? <laughs> uh, which again, it's weird. Um, and then the last one was reassigning responsibility. And one of the things that was very interesting was basically you just give everything to the practitioner. Everything is practitioner's fault, or it's future work, but it's not clear whose future work is it. And in fact, there were societal impact statements where it said that this model can be used to harm minorities and underrepresented people, um, but that's part of future work. <laughs> Who's going to do it? It's not clear, right? Um, so uh, it was it was uh, depressing to do my first um, qualitative study, um, but so be it. Then. There was an ethics committee at NeurIPS. Uh, oh, and for those of you who don't know, NeurIPS is this very big, prominent uh, machine learning, data mining, AI conference. And in terms of the ethics reviews, some of the things that we found was the reviewers didn't know whether something was a policy or a non-policy. Obviously, if you plagiarize somebody, that's a policy, right? And your paper gets rejected. And what's the scope and the authority of these ethics uh, reviews? There were only there was only one paper that got rejected in NeurIPS 2021, uh, and it, the reason being that it was really around the data, and there were a lot of issues with the data itself. And in terms of the recommendations from the ethics reviews, was more about. Um, you know, why don't you more clearly identify the negative societal impacts and also list how you would mitigate it? And one of the things that was interesting was that as this was going back and forth, um, a lot of the uh, the changes that the authors were making was either citing other papers or uh, basically retracting uh, what they were saying about what their model could do. Um, and so. In terms of this question that we had about how do AI researchers describe uh, and, and respond to the negative impact of their work on society badly, um, there's a lot of education uh, in front of us and reflection about what we're doing and what kind of harm it causes. And in particular, and these are my people, right? The AI machine learning people are my people. There's this us versus them thing. And it's like, you are one of them. You live in this society. Your algorithms will affect you as well. And so where is the state of the community on this? 
So what has happened is that now there are different CS venues targeting the societal impacts. The first one was this uh, fact. Um, so for fairness, accountability and transparency, which started in the mid nine, uh, mid 2010s um, as a workshop. You may have heard of it as Fat ML or Fat Star. And then um, in 2018, a new conference formed this AI um, Ethics and Society, uh, where there was this feeling that perhaps the FACT conference wasn't as welcoming to philosophers, because as you can imagine, uh, ethics and applied ethics falls under philosophy. And then in 2020, there was this new conference yet called FORC, uh, appropriately, Foundations of Responsible Computing, that was established by folks like Cynthia Dwork, et cetera, that perhaps believed that fact wasn't theoretical enough. And then in 2021, um, there was yet a new ACM conference on equity and access and algorithms, mechanisms, and optimization. And these are more from the EC community, the uh, e-commerce community, more the optimization community. And so, at least in terms of the, our communities, uh, we have not converged. Right now, we're expanding. We're diverging in terms of um, these different uh, uh, folks uh, going and talking amongst themselves, right, which is uh, not a good thing. Um, and in particular, the last one, this, uh, the one on equity and access and algorithms, mechanisms, and optimization, uh, there's this group me uh, mechanism designed for social good where they really look into algorithms in civic participation. So, for example, um, some of you may know about sortition or citizen assemblies that have been around since um, the Greek <laughs> time. Uh, it's similar to our jury duties, right, where you randomly sample people from your population and you um, um, discuss important issues. So, for example, in Ireland, um, the issue of abortion or, or gay marriage uh, was resolved through sortition. And so there's this notion of what algorithm should you use uh, to have a representative uh, sample of your society. Uh, there are notions of this liquid democracy where you delegate your vote to somebody. Um, there are notions of this virtual democracy where uh, you would use computer mediated um, discussions um to to move uh democracy forward um there are this notion of of quadratic voting so basically if you live in wyoming uh, your vote matters more than if you live in california you all know this um and so you have a market uh, for the votes and then the last is uh, this notion of uh participatory budgeting where um it basically reduces to problems like the knapsack problem, right? So you live in a city, let's say Pleasanton, um, the town only has $10,000. Uh, you want a, a new park. Uh, I want the potholes to get fixed. Uh, how are they going to spend that that 10000 And so they do um, this kind of crowdsource democracy. And Ishish Gol at, uh, at Stanford has done a lot of work on that. Uh, so this is another angle of algorithms coming in to your daily life. Um, that you should watch out for. And in particular, I'll finish with this and leave some time for discussion. Some food for thought is that if uh, an algorithm is being used in these high stakes situations, policing, criminal justice, finding a job, uh, school assignments, et cetera, et cetera, should that algorithm have system one thinking or should it have system two thinking? Um, so system one thinking is the fast thinking, right? Instinctive and emotional system two thinking is slower and more deliberate and more logical. And at least, you know, when you go in front of a judge or, you know, a doctor or whatever, you would hope that they're doing system two thinking and not system one thinking, but they spend a lot of time looking at algorithms using criminal justice. It seems like they're all doing system one, that fast, instinctive and emotional thinking. And this is an area that's coming up. Within AI, so there's this false symposium on thinking fast and slow and other cognitive theories in AI um, that uh, is going to happen in November uh, in terms of what properties uh, should the AI systems have if they're being used um, to affect somebody's life. And if I were to have you take away one thing would be this picture that your algorithm, whatever system you're developing, does not live in isolation. It is not an island. It's part of a complex system, 
and that you need to worry about the complex system and the feedback processes that, that are there and how that affects your algorithm. And lastly, here are the references of the papers that I mentioned. You can download them all on my website. And uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. And you can download the slides from this URL. I'll put it up a little bit so you can write it down. And then I will stop sharing. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Tina. Um, we already have a question from Adam in, in the chat. So I'll go ahead and, and read that to you. Um, in, in the meantime, feel free to fill up the chat with uh, more questions or, or come off mute and ask uh, Tina a question. Um, so Adam asks, I think this was back in the segment where you were talking about the Bayesian networks, and he was wondering with those examples if the point of the model was to determine how a biased model, how far a biased model is from a given ideal, and asks if the underlying idea that we view opportunity through this veil of ignorance, then the objective way to determine the outcome is talent. So. We were talking about this uh, fairy tale of, of opportunity, right? So fairy tale of the opportunity is about advantageous positions in society. And so that's why talent comes about, right? That you would hope that the most talented person would end up with those kinds of jobs, as opposed to, I don't know, your father went to Harvard or your father gave a hundred million dollars to Harvard. And so now you're there. Um, and so, uh, then the question was, where can you intervene? So can you intervene at uh, when you're getting a job or should you intervene upstream? And so um, intervening upstream in terms of providing opportunities to people um, seemed the right thing to do. Now, again, the notion of talent and what is the right talent and that distribution of talent is where things can get sticky and depending on you know, where you get your talent distribution and where I get my talent distribution from, uh, you can make very different policy recommendations. And so that's where you need transparency and that's where you need people with uh, boots on the ground. So some of you may know about Rahib Ghani. He was uh, the guy who um, was the founder of Data Science for Social Good. And he still runs this summer program, this excellent summer program. He's now at Carnegie Mellon University where for each project of the students, the interns actually work closely with a partner, right? Um, and they go and they talk, for example, one of their projects this year was which houses in Baltimore should be demolished. And so you go and you actually talk to the community to figure out how would demolishing this house whose roof is partially collapsed affect that community. And in a lot of these cases, um, there is this trade off between how many people you can help and um, how much money you have. So Sherrod Goyle, who was a professor at Stanford, who moved now to Harvard, um, has this project with Lyft where Lyft has given him $100,000 uh, for him to help people get through their court dates. And you all know in California, there are places where, for example, it takes somebody three hours to get there uh, between walking and public transportation. Now you can help more people if, if the lift rides are shorter and the cost is less, um, but is that the right thing to do? So, so the, there, there are these very tricky issues here and just like sitting in one's ivory tower and solving an optimization problem is not the right thing to do. Actually going and talking to the community members is the right thing to do. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Tina. Um, we've got another question from jo uh, Joanne Levitin. Uh, she asks, have you read any papers by Ernesto Lee, who's a professor of data science at Miami Data University, who addresses bias in his course? I have not. Uh, is there a special way that he's addressing it that that comes to your mind? Um, Joanne, if yes. you can. If yes, you know. he, he actually has a whole method of rebalancing his data so that it reduces the bias if that is possible okay he just picks he, he says you're you're allowed to re, you know reselect data and he has a confusion matrix which helps you find data that is biased because for example in some cases you're always going to get a yes answer because all the data is is yes data okay <laughs> Yeah, so, so, yes, so there's lots of work along those lines and I will look this this particular scholar up. 
Um, the one thing is that um, one needs to be very careful in terms of quote unquote rebalancing or whatever uh, your data. For example, there was this case uh, where Google's facial recognition, I'm sure you all heard, where mm -hmm. they labeled an African American couple. Um, uh, they, they didn't do a good job. Let's just put it that way. Then they were like, oh, we don't have enough black people in our system, in our data. So they hire a subcontractor. The subcontractor says, where can I find more black people? They're like Atlanta. So they go to Atlanta and then they give $5 to any college student or homeless person they find who happens to be yeah. black and take their picture. Right. And now you have more black people in your data. However, uh, you, you don't have a good representation of that population. And when this hit the fan, uh, of course, Google is like, well, we hired a subcontractor. It wasn't our fault. And so, uh, again, with any of these kinds of things in terms of fairness, bias, et cetera, et cetera, uh, one really needs to look at and work with the community. And as uh, Sophia Noble, who's a professor at UCLA, says, says uh, I love her quotation, which says, you have no business in designing technology for society if you don't know society. And so what we have are predominantly a bunch of privileged people who are designing algorithms who are being used in society but do not know how actually society works. And so that's why actually being in the, um, in the community helps a lot and talking to them. Well, I was just going to say that this person did not suggest going out and finding new data. He just wanted to look more closely at the data they had to judge its, you know, its worth. And he, I think he did it fairly. I think you should read his paper before you pass a judgment about. No, no, I wasn't passing a judgment. I would look. I'm a yeah. speaker, and I'm telling you what's happening yeah. after you know looking at this for you know for over five years. I will, of course, read the the person's work. However. What I told you about the problem, that problem exists. Now, anybody who takes another look at their data, good for them. They should, especially since machine learning, data mining people think data comes from God and they do not look at it, unlike physicists, unlike biologists who think about the processes that, that develop their data. So I thank you for your comments. Thanks, Tina. Um, let's see, we have uh, two, two related lines of thought here. Another question from Adam. Do you think the idea of selecting based on talent lowers neural diversity um, since society can often view um, people on the spectrum as less talented? Um, uh, uh, Ji Young asks um, kind of as a follow up of how the model of talent could be improved as, you know, obvious. Per, uh, perceived talent is not as simple as yes or no, and, and have you or other people uh, looked at you know, how, how to uh, quantify talent, I guess? Yes, so it, in many cases, these are all become one-off things. So you may have heard about um, this case where uh, a lot of the symphonies did not have women in them. So they ran this experiment where um, the people who would decide would be behind a curtain and the people who would come on stage to perform for them would take their shoes off as well, because usually women's shoes clank, clink and clank more. And when they did this kind of a setup, lo and behold, more women were hired into symphonies, right? So there are these societal biases and depending on what the talent is that you're hiring for, Right, you can set up these kinds of situations. They cost money, whether it matters or not, whether the people in power. In fact, one of the things which I didn't mention is why, for example, do the healthcare folks want an algorithm to be used? Is it really to provide a better healthcare for you, or is it so the doctor spends um, 10 minutes with you as opposed to 15? Right, and so this notion of power. Now, of course, in terms of the example I just gave with symphony, <laughs> Um, you still have to come from a certain social economic status, so your parents could send you and to get, you know, um, training uh, to play the violin early on. So there's some of that going on, um, but at least we can move it to more of a quote unquote fairer society um, in terms of cer certain kinds of uh, talent. Um, again, measuring talent is difficult, uh, like anything else that I said in this one. In this talk is actually going and talking to the community. Um, so this, and in fact, one of the problems with this fairness in machine learning algorithmic bias is that 
There is a divide between people who work in this. There are people who come from the underrepresented and the marginalized part of our society who say, look, your algorithms are causing harm to people now. Maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should think about it. And then there are people who oftentimes are privileged and who are like, look, I'm advancing science. I'm patting themselves on the back. And unfortunately, I do not see these two coming together. And there are people who are making money off of it and people are getting harmed. And it's just whether you care about it or not. Maybe you don't. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> but at least we should be honest. Uh, the one thing is at least machine learning AI people should be honest and not say my algorithm will work on anybody and anything, which it doesn't, obviously. Thanks, Tina. Um, I, yeah. I've got one question for you. Back when you were talking about the generative complex network models, um, I was wondering if you could walk us through an example there. So when thinking about this in context of your talk, what, what's a good example for me? What are my nodes and edges? And in that model, why would information propagation kind of matter? And can these networks that you're thinking about be redesigned to have this better propagation that you might want to design for? Yeah, so think about any online social network. Think about LinkedIn, think about Facebook, right? And think about how misinformation or disinformation spreads through it, right? And suppose you're meta and you care about not spreading misinformation or disinformation. Suppose you care. <laughs> suppose it doesn't make you lots of money that misinformation and disinformation is being spread. Suppose you really want to do good, right? Then, then the nodes are people, right? The links are friendship. And depending on what I post and who sees it and whether they decide to share it, et cetera, information gets spread, whether about vaccines or about anything else that you want. And so then the question is, if you want the right piece of information to be spread through this network at the same rate between the different groups of your society, how would you change, intervene on this network so that you can um, get the goal you want? And so one of the things that we showed is that it's not just good enough to say, okay, I'm not going to show anything that Tina is posting to Keith, <laughs> right? Um, that it's it's more complicated because Keith could see something that I post through Brian, right, or other other folks. And so it's not just about the network structure; it's about what the contents of that that and what the quality and what the features of that spreading process is. So there's, for example, certain processes, uh, so certain uh, certain information that spread symmetrically between, let's say, Republicans, um, uh, but, but they don't do the same way do, uh, among Democrats, right? And so if you really care about facts, truth, whatever, <laughs> um, then perhaps you could classify what kind of process this is, and then the recommendations that you give to Tina about who to befriend, et cetera, could be such that it moves the network closer to what you want. So our, our initial applications were things like LinkedIn network, the LinkedIn economic graph, um, the Facebook friendship network, so on and so forth. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. Bringing that home with an example makes it a lot, a lot more clear for me. Thanks for walking through that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I decided, it, it, I think, I'm, at least from my uh, recollection of the lab, I figure that it's best to give you guys a broad overview of what is happening in this field um, than go in depth into about one paper. Oh, absolutely. We can always look up the specific topic yeah. we are interested in. Um, we we are at the top of the hour. There's one. We'll, we'll end with one last question from Dylan, who has his hands up, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll let you go. Uh, Dylan. Uh, hello. So. Towards the end of the talk, I heard you, talk, heard you um, talk about thinking fast and slow and it's like implications in AI. I remember when I read that book, it was really interesting. And a lot of the distinctions of like system two is about like, humans being really bad intuitive statisticians and how like, um, uh, like not crunching the numbers, just doing like quick associative answers. But the system two, the harder thinking is like doing the mathematics. And I was thinking, is that like challenging for AI or are like system one and two defined differently in that field? Because it seems like the number crunching stuff should be easy. 
Yeah, so so the question is, do you know of a system that does system two thinking? Do, do you know of an AI system that is actually does system two thinking? So perhaps like some of the old um, uh, th uh, theorem provers, <laughs> Uh, like Otter and Q theorem. Now I'm showing my name, my my age. Uh, that we're doing deduction, and their system too. But right now we are in in uh, in an era uh, where it's all about I learn from data, right? And in fact, when you talk to folks, uh, for example, like Jan Lukan, who happens to also be a friend of mine, so he knows what I have to say. He cares about just uh, um, robust predictions. It's like, all I care about is robust predictions. I don't really care so much about, um, you know, why things are happening. And in fact, he says, we're doing the engineering now, the science comes later. And so to me, some of this system, one thing in this being fast is more like engineering though, for example, in the area that I discussed, you don't build a bridge just for white people, but we have algorithms, right? That only work on white people. And so the, the, the question is, how do we change that? And perhaps, these requirements that your system, if it's going to be using criminal justice, it has to have some form of system two and define what that means by system two. Um, so thank, thanks, Tina. We'll go ahead and, and end here. Just want to thank you for your your time and your presentation. A very interesting topic here. And I, I hope for you know those of you who are still on the call will will take a pause after this seminar and think about how the ideas that Tina has presented relate to your work and have implications for improving the 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 quality when it comes to um, fairness in, in your work. That how you can apply this there. So thanks again, Tina, and we'll see you all next month.